Hi there, welcome to Coping with COVID. I am your host, Will Shahab, and on this show we like to dive deep with our guests on their best strategies to coping during this time, as well as their favorite show, movie, and album they recommend. This episode we have a special guest, an ETHS statistics teacher, who will help us learn how to interpret some of the statistics that we are seeing during this time. Now let's go meet our guest. Hi, if you could please welcome my next guest, Mr. Mills. He's an ETHS AP statistics teacher. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Will. Of course. And um, before we jump into any questions, may I please get a show, movie, and album recommendation? So a show recommendation, um, we just finished Little Fires Everywhere um, on Amazon. Um, Great show. I think it was a book originally, and then they made it a show. Movie recommendation, Abe, A-B-E. That one, I believe, is on Amazon as well. Um, Really good show about a kid that um, enjoys cooking. Album recommendation, no good recommendations there. Um, Although I've been going through some new Spotify channels lately, I really like the 90s throwback hits from when I was a kid. Um, So those are some of the channels that I enjoy on Spotify. And from the 90s, which uh, artists were your favorite? Um, you know, I, I really liked the boy bands as cliche as it is. I liked in sync backstreet boys. Those, those were some of the, the, the bands that I enjoyed growing up. They were great hits. So you have to respect it for what it is. Jumping into the questions with the stay at home order being extended about an extra month. How have you been doing? Uh, we've been doing well. Um, you know, we've been staying at home at home a lot, uh, just going out. Um, I usually am the one going out for groceries. Um, we go for small walks, uh, with the dog, but we've been doing puzzles, cooking a lot, baking a lot. Um, I just recently got out to play some golf once they opened the golf courses, but for the most part, we've, we've been getting by, um, staying healthy. That's good. And being one of the ETHS golf coaches, What's your favorite course uh, that you've ever played at? Um, my favorite course I ever played at in the area, um, and I actually just played it yesterday, Flossmoor uh, Golf Club down in Flossmoor, Illinois. So south, southwest of Chicago. Really nice course. Um, there was obviously nobody out really yesterday with you know the regulations that they have out. The weather was great. Um, it's a really nice course. They keep it in great shape. Um, and it's also pretty challenging as well. Um, there's a lot of other good courses in the area that I haven't played yet. Um, but that's my favorite so far that I've played recently. Nice. And uh, what have you and your wife been baking at home? So she does most of the baking. I give some inspiration or things that I'd like to see cooked. Um, we've made croissants, bagels, made cookies, banana bread, all sorts of stuff. But those, those are the ones that come to mind as my favorites. Being a notorious donut aficionado, which uh, have you tried to make any donuts at home yet? We have not tried to make any donuts yet. We're gonna we're gonna work on that more. Um, you know, my favorite donuts are old fashioned donuts um, from Do Right, and those are pretty tricky to master. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna try to maybe work on those at some point. But I, I might leave that work up to the professionals. The Do Right Donuts is still open for all of you at home who are craving a great donut or chicken sandwich. Moving on, what is your favorite way to pass the time? Um, so I mentioned a couple of them, you know, the golf as of recently has been great. I enjoy, we, we, we've been working on a puzzle. It's actually sitting right behind my computer, um, at our kitchen table here for a while now. It's a big puzzle. It's a little bit difficult. So we'll do that at night or on the weekends. Um, we've watched some of our favorite shows. We also got some home workout equipment. So trying to stay in shape and stay healthy, um, during this time, considering all of the baked goods that we've we've been consuming what puzzle are you currently building because uh, my family we also are in the bit of a puzzle craze we did an 80s puzzle a uh, new york city puzzle and a soldier field puzzle nice um i think i have the box right over here it's kind of like a it's a ski season puzzle it has a lodge with blood field skiing um, it looks like that it took us about three or four weeks for it to come in the mail. Uh, you got to be pretty patient. A lot of places are sold out, um, but we've been working on this one for a while. It's kept us busy. For all of those of you at home who are looking for a great place to buy puzzles from and also support a local place, Becky and Me Toys, located in Evanston on Grove Street, they still sell puzzles online. For all of you Young XP fans out there, the merchandise is still being shipped out and still being fulfilled. When this is all over, what's the first thing you will do? You know, we have a small group of friends, four or five other couples um, that we get together and we cook dinner with on a monthly basis. It's kind of a little supper club. You know, this is over and it's safe to gather in small groups. I think we'll get together and cook dinner with our friends 
catch up and, you know, it'll be nice to interact with some other people physically since we've been doing a lot of Zoom calls with friends. Um, so that's something that we're looking forward to and something that we enjoy. enjoy. That's a lot of fun. And uh, what's your favorite thing to cook with your friends at these little cookouts? Uh, great question. So each month we we have a different theme. So for example, past themes have been French. We'll cook things that are you know traditional French dishes. Um, we've done Peruvian. We've done Japanese where we made sushi one time. Thai, American for like a 4th of July um, theme. So we try to cycle through, you know, as many different countries and cultures as we can. You know, our friends really enjoy cooking as well. And so for us, it's just about, you know, challenging ourselves and eating new things and trying new things and cooking it with with the people that we like to hang out together. And what's been your favorite theme so far? Good question. You know, you mentioned Do Right has donuts. They also have fried chicken sandwiches. We did a Southern brunch theme one time um, where we made fried chicken um, and some other things. I went on a trip to South Carolina a while back. Um, and I really enjoyed some of the cooking that, and the food that I had down there. So we tried to replicate some of those with shrimp and grits. That was probably my favorite one. It was really heavy food. Um, it's pretty indulgent, but that was probably my favorite so far. Yeah, we just uh, recently, my grandpa, for he and my dad, even though they're not related, they share a birthday. And he and my grandma came on over at distance, sat across the backyard from us, and we made them fried chicken. And my grandpa said it was the best fried chicken he had in 20 years, and also the only fried chicken he's had in 20 years. Fried chicken is, I don't know, I love it. And it's really <laughs> fun to make. It's great. What was your favorite high school memory? Uh, face club, favorite high school memory. Um, you know, you sent me some of the questions and I've been thinking about that one the most. So I was, I was a wrestler in high school, um, on the varsity wrestling team. And we didn't have a ton of success as a team, most of my high school career, but our senior year, we won the team district title. Um, and I was the kind of the last match of the, of the night. And I was able to clinch the, the district title for the team. You know, looking back, that's probably my most vivid memory from high school. Something that I was, I was proud of. And it was kind of the culmination of all the years that I had been putting into the sport. And it was at the very end of my senior year. So that's probably my favorite memory. And uh, do you remember the name of the guy who you took down in order to win your school the title? I do not. Um, I, I know what high school he was from, but I do not remember his name. I, I couldn't tell you. And uh, your brother was a wrestler too. Is that right? Yeah. So I, I have two younger brothers. The My middle brother was a wrestler just in high school, just a couple of years. Um, my youngest brother, who's eight years younger than me, wrestled in high school and he was pretty successful. He was all state a couple of years in high school um, and then wrestled at Stanford University as a walk-on for a couple of years. Um, he's graduating from Stanford um, this spring. So yeah, there was a lot of wrestling in my family. My dad coached wrestling um, at the high school and collegiate level. So it's the sport that, you know, has been around our family for a while. That's awesome. And since you're a statistics teacher, I thought it would be important to ask, how should we interpret a lot of these COVID statistics that we see in the news, on social media, and just all around us constantly? I think two of the statistics that I've been following um, the most are probably the, the positive test rate, which is the percentage of people that test positive out of all people that we test for the coronavirus. You know, that's something that we want to track to see as we increase testing. Are there less people testing positive? That should give us a better idea of the spread of the infection um, and the spread of the virus. Um, the other statistic that I like to track is the r not value. Um, um, which is, you know, how many people does one person, does one infected person infect? And so that kind of tells you if the growth is exponential, um, if it's linear, or if it's, you know, decreasing. Um, and so, you know, an R out of one would mean that one infected person also infects one other person on average. Um, and so if that value gets too high, then we have exponential growth. And that's why we would we talk about flattening the curve and not overwhelming the hospital system. Um, so that's one one statistic that I've been following. It's also difficult. There's a lot of different um, universities and just individual epidemiologists that have tried to track that and estimate that. It's a really hard thing to estimate real time. You kind of have to do it retroactively and look back at the data to figure out what that number was. Um, but I think that'll be our, one of our better indicators going forward on are we keeping this virus under control? There's been a chart that's been circulating around i know it's on a logarithmic scale and it shows the trajectory of each uh country after they uh found had 100 positive cases 
how reliable or how should we interpret a test like uh, uh, a graph like that, especially one on the logarithmic scale? Yeah, so I think there's there's two different graphs that I've seen are being circulated around on a logarithmic scale. One is your is a total case count as the y axis, you know, and when when people look at graphs like that, they're expecting cases the graph to go down to decrease. But when you're listing total cases, total cases can only go up; they can only increase. And so I think that's the most common one that we see is, you know, over time, what's our total case count? And that's the one that we expect to flatten out over time, that it may be exponential at first, but we expect the curve to flatten. Um, the other type of graph that might be on a logarithmic scale is the daily case count. And that's that's a graph that will or should go down over time. You know, you'll have a, a, a spike in daily cases. And then over time, that graph should begin to decrease um, and should get closer and closer to, to zero. So I think that the public sometimes has a hard time distinguishing between those graphs if they're not reading the y-axis label. Not only is it linear or logarithmic, but is it listing total case count or daily case count? Uh, total case count, as I mentioned, that graph will never go down, right? We're only adding a number to that each day. We're never subtracting a number from it. So I think it's important when people are looking at these graphs in the news and, and talking about them with friends that, you know, we're talking about them in a correct way um, and an accurate way. Um, and I think that sometimes, you know, headlines um, and things that people say amongst each other can can spread misinformation. And so you want to be really careful when you're looking at those graphs. Uh, just one more question related to the COVID statistics. Have you seen any of these simulations where they have the dots moving around? And do you think that those are good ways to visually represent how certain efforts can work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's a good, you know, simplistic way to think about how a virus spreads throughout a community. You know, there's a lot of other variables that those simulations don't account for, um, which is, you know, people might go into their house and they, they don't have as much of a risk of that little dot bumping into another dot. But I think it's a good simplistic way of explaining and showing people visually, you know, how a virus can spread and that when dots are stationary, um, they have less of a of a likelihood of running into another dot, you know, the whole part of social distancing and staying at home. Um, so I, I do appreciate that was, and I think it does get out, you know, the core message of what the government is trying to do with keeping people safe. Thank you so much for coming on. Is there anything you would like to say before we wrap up? No, that's it. Thanks for having me on, Will. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure having you and a bunch of other students in class this year. I know this is not the way we envisioned that your, your high school career would end. Um, but I'm just really proud of the students at ETHS for, you know, for sticking it out and continuing to learn and engage in the content. Um, I think it says a lot about the students at our school and their willingness to, you know, continue to learn despite all the challenges that we have around us right now. Yeah, and thank you so much. Uh, you were an awesome teacher this year. Uh, I know my friends, I had a lot of close friends in that class, and I know we could have been a little goofy sometimes, but we really appreciated you coming up to us and telling us your Super Bowl predictions, March Madness strategies, tips like that. And uh, thank you so much for coming on, and we hope you continue to stay safe. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Will. Thank you again, Mr. Mills, for coming on. I really appreciate you being able to come on and help us understand these uh, COVID statistics, as well as be an awesome and amazing teacher throughout the year. I know you're, you're very beloved by all of your students. AP statistics was much more fun than I could have imagined. Tune in next episode with our guest, Nick Held, a senior from Houston, Texas, who will tell us about not only his favorite ways to cope with the time, but also how Houston is reacting to the COVID crisis. Thank you so much for tuning in. They expecting all these big things. No, I won't let you down. No, I won't let you down. No, I won't let and you I down. And I got a lot of big dreams. I swear they'll come around. I swear they'll come around. Yeah, I swear they'll come and around. And you told me that you miss me. I heard you.